This video will define a cadillo, explain the historical setting in which they arose, and provide examples of particular countries and specific cadillos. Cadillos were regional strongmen who rose to power in Latin America in the wake of the socio-political vacuum produced by independence. They ruled through clientelism, in which rural, lower-class people pledged allegiance to their cadillo in exchange for immediate and concrete goods like protection, food, and land. Cadillos were often creoles from wealthy land-owning families who were able to use their charisma and military success to garner support from lower-class rural people. Why was clientelism so prevalent and appealing during this time in Latin America? There were a number of factors that contributed to clientelism and the rise of cadillos, including a colonial legacy of violence and case social hierarchies, the violence and chaos created during the struggle for independence, as well as a lack of socio-political order in post-independence Latin America. Apart from the chaos of independence, there were colonial factors that contributed to clientelism. The strict case social system, absolute power by Spanish monarchy, and the violence of the con conquistadors predisposed Latin Americans to adopting a form of socio-political governance in which resources are provided directly in exchange for loyalty. In this sense, clientelism was a default option in times of chaos and was not so dissimilar from colonial era practices, which had instilled an every-man-for-himself attitude in Latin America. Spain and other European colonial masters did not relinquish their control of the region willingly. The struggle for independence produced a multitude of violence throughout Latin America, and this violence continued once independence was achieved, leaving the region on the brink of anarchy. This meant that protection and land were valuable resources, both things that Cadillos could provide. Independence meant that Latin American nations were suddenly without the socio-political socio structures imposed by the Spanish monarchy and the Catholic Church. Clientelism was appealing because in the midst of the violence and chaos, Cadillos provided a direct form of socio-political order. What made a Cadillo successful? Cadillos were able to gain and hold their position of power through mastering three key skills. The ability to connect with the lower class masses, the strategic distribution of goods gained from pillaging, and the unapologetic administration of justice. Despite the strict colonial social hierarchies persisting post-independence, the way in which power was achieved and maintained did change. Importantly, power was now dependent on one's ability to garner support from and mobilize the lower class. Successful cadillos were masters at this. They adopted the language and customs of rural peoples in order to develop a close paternal relationship with followers. Similarly, pillaging during these times was common, and Cadillos strategically distributed their bounty to lower fo loyal fo followers, which served to further indoctrinate patrons. Cadillos were followers, and their followers took on judicial roles, often showing enemies little mercy. The short story, The Slaughterhouse, written by Unitarian liberal author Esteban Echevarria, tells the story of Afro-Argentine followers of De Rosas brutalizing and killing a young Unitarian. This displays the cruelty and violence perpetrated by Cadillos and their followers against their enemies. Caudillos typically exist and thrive within a specific political system. Termed caudillismo, this political system entails a power imbalance and a loyalty exchange between caudillos and their followers. Functioning as patrons, these caudillos maintain their following by promising to provide their clients with profitable favors during times of need, and in return, caudillos imply an expectation of unconditional loyalty on the part of their clients. Various versions of caudillismo have been and continue to be applied in numerous Latin American countries, one of which is the nation of Paraguay. Traits inherent in Paraguayan society and culture have tailored the socio-political context of the country to allow for the smooth emergence of a caudillismo-like system of government. For one, Paraguay lacks both an effective welfare program and overall job and business protection. This has left many Paraguayans searching for an alternative source of support. By pledging loyalty to a strong man or, in the case of a more modern Paraguay, a major political 
political party. Paraguayan citizens ensure some form of consistent aid and so achieve a sense of security. Paraguayans also highly value the trade of loyalty, often emphasizing the need for people and groups to remain loyal to one another, whatever the cost. From this, the notion of a compadrazgo arises, which is a type of relationship that facilitates a family-like bond between people who are not genetically related to one another. Compadrazgo relationships are often created with the intention of widening one's support network. This type of relationship, based on the same notion of loyalty as caudillismo, entails coming to the aid of those who have pledged some form of allegiance to. Paraguay's history has been riddled with unstable dictatorships and a constant transfer of power. In a period of significant turmoil, the War of the Triple Alliance broke out, which saw Paraguayans struggling against the combined nations of Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. The war resulted in two distinct major political parties in Paraguay, Partido Colorado and Partido Liberal. The formation of these two parties is essentially the genesis of a national caudillismo-like system. Supporters of both political parties tended to base their allegiances on a sense of personal loyalty rather than a strong belief in the political ideologies put forward by either party. However, supporters of Partido Colorado were distinct from their counterparts in two major ways, in the level of education they had attained and the needs they perceived to be most pertinent for themselves and their families. On the one hand, supporters of Partido Colorado were typically city-based, educated individuals seeking overall structural reforms for the nation. Supporters of Partido Liberal, on the other hand, were typically rural-based individuals who were not likely to be well-educated and were often supporting this political party for the sake of garnering personal benefits for themselves and their families. By supporting the nation's major political parties, a vast majority of Paraguayan citizens finally attained a sense of self-efficacy. In perceiving the party's reliance on the support of civilians, the Paraguayan people began to feel as if, finally, power was equalizing between patrons and clients. Ultimately, many of these Paraguayan citizens felt that they were becoming deeply involved in great political decisions. And although it was a reciprocal relationship, it was quite an unbalanced one. Given all of this, it seems that many Paraguayans did not take issue with this variant of caudillismo. For the more rural-based individuals, the favor-for-favor favor system between themselves and their political candidates seemed ideal, and although it was to a lesser extent, a similar sentiment was felt by those from the cities. Juan Manuel de Rosas is one of the most notable caudillos in Latin American history and can be described in many ways. Was he an evil man filled with violence and corruption who terrorized his province and its people for 23 years? Or was he a man that came into power during a time when Buenos Aires was in extreme disorder with Unitarian rule and saved it? As a man that heard the voices of the lower class and provided what Argentina needed in order to stay strong, a strict and orderly leader. These opinions on Rosas's rule and legacy has created deep divisions in Argentine society, even to this day. Rosas was born in 1793 to a family of wealthy landowners where he grew up learning about the land. He was then recruited into the military and fought in the wars of independence. He was inclined towards business, but the country was in need of political help, so he decided that he could combine politics with his experience in business to help his country. He therefore became governor of Buenos Aires in 1829. His regime provided social and economic stability that allowed people to slowly make the transition from the mindset of Argentina as a colony to a nation. Being a federalist, Rosas's main enemies, the Unitarians, would have said that his regime used extreme examples of authoritarianism, violence, and censorship, and a backward social system that impeded national progress. This group was strongly a liberal political party embracing a more European view on politics, with the mindset that traditional Argentine culture was standing in the way of modernization. One of Rosas's main policies was to punish his opposers and reward his supporters, further increasing the divide between the Federalists and the Unitarians. The rule of Juan Manuel de Rosas was that of terror and violence. His personal army, the Mazorca, was extremely repressive and terrifying. He and his army regularly ignored the rule of law and used extreme violence and intimidation to exterminate the resistance against him. Being a follower of Rosas was the safest option for the people, and that is what many people did. To the people that supported Rosas, he gave many benefits. He returned land to the lower class whose land had been taken from them in previous conflicts. Additionally, he gave the lower class people a voice, and in exchange for this, they gave him their loyal support. His supporters saw him as the protector of Argentine identity, a practitioner of culture, and an opponent of the liberal mindset. Porfirio Diaz is probably one of the most controversial figures in Mexican history. 
He was an Indian from Oaxaca who embodied radical liberal ideas, supported Mexican president at the time, Benito Juarez, and had a successful military career. Diaz fought as the commander of the army in the Mexicans' victory in Puebla against the French. In 1876, he took control of Mexico by ousting the president and led from 1876 to 1880, then from 1884 until his forced resignation in 1911. This period is known as the Porfiriato. Diaz is controversial because although he achieved great progress of modernization, it came at the expense of the lower class through violence and repression. Like most Cadillas, Diaz arose to power because society was torn by class conflicts. Mexican society consisted of an enduring class struggle between large estate owners known as Asendados and Indian Mestizos. He gained support from Indian Mestizos as they thought Diaz would ameliorate lower classes way of life. Diaz established local armies endeavoring to seize national control. The military was Diaz's way to power, similar to most Latin American caudillos. He seized the presidency by a coup d'etat. He had the support of the military and Indians and small landowners because they thought he'd support land reform. Diaz radically changed political, social, and economic institutions in Mexico. The motto of the era was order and progress. He stabilized finances, restructured the economy, improved the oil industry, installed railways, and gained foreign capital. Undeniably, he modernized Mexico during his terms. American journalist James Creelman interviewed Diaz in 1908, revealing how he was captivated and in awe of the progressivism, praising him for his modern achievements. However, he neglects that Diaz was a dictator, and most Mexicans did not benefit, as the wealth was concentrated in the elites. He came to power claiming to support fair elections, but then became too entrenched in power and his leadership greatly repressed the marginalized populations. Furthermore, Diaz's rise to power was extremely authoritarian as he practiced clientelism, exchanging material rewards for elite support. Over three decades, Diaz prioritized a relationship with upper-class Creoles and the Indian and lower classes were completely disregarded. Diaz was not concerned with extending his power into lower class communities, revealing the failing democratic qualities of caudillism, reflecting an unequal society. Diaz controlled the press, exiled dissidents, jailed opponents without trials, and used his army to maintain peace at any cost. Moreover, his government style embodies the concept of a strongman. Diaz is famous for stealing indigenous land and distributing it to the elites to appease them, making the rich richer and the poor poor. This strongly characterizes a caudillo leader as Diaz relied on clientele relationships in which he favored the elites and displaced the peasants. Arguably, some aspects of the Porfiriato were positive as the economy boomed. However, the social consequences were devastating for the peasants. In 1910, 96% of the agricultural population was landless. Wages sharply declined, starvation arose due to the lack of agricultural production for domestic consumption, and life expectancy rates decayed. The population's discontent of Diaz, this brutal repression, eventually sparked the Mexican Revolution in 1910, as disadvantaged workers and peasants who suffered under the dictatorship advocated for justice and equality. Ultimately, Diaz can be characterized as a caudillo due to his personalistic leadership, dictator qualities, strongman features, maintenance of power based on clientelism, and undemocratic conditions. An article published by the Washington Post described that caudillo mentality may be making its return. Many Latin American journalists have voiced their opinions about the new president of the United States, drawing many parallels to Latin American caudillos. Similarities include taking a stand for the forgotten man, the middle class, his tough talk, and his contempt with traditional politics. It is the general sense of radically changing the way things are done politically and the idea that this new leader will make things better for many people.